Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. I hope you've all been having a great day. And tweeting? Who's been tweeting? Yay! Now, a little Twitter fact for you. Guess how many Twitter followers Matt Moran has? You know, because we talked about it. Anyone like to have a guess? Five and a half thousand? Five and a half thousand? Twenty thousand? You ready? Anyone who doesn't think Twitter's important? 69.7 thousand followers. So one tweet from him today could potentially reach 69,000 people. So it's like rabbits breeding. For farmers who don't get it, you send out a tweet, someone retweets it, you, you, you set it free and off it goes. So please tweet. You have to go and learn. <laughs> I'll be running classes tomorrow. One bottle of French champagne gets you half an hour of my time. <laughs> Well, before I introduce our next speaker, I'd first like to take this opportunity to thank the Department of Agriculture for funding this event and the Victorian Department of Primary Industries, Telstra and Konica Minolta for also sponsoring. And anybody who's in Landcare knows how hard it is to get sponsors, so I think you might have to give them a round of applause so they feel appreciated. <laughs> And I once uh, was at a conference talking about Twitter and somebody got on his phone and he said, I just joined. You're my first and I'm following you. And so I pulled my phone out and I said, well, I'm your first follower. And he had 50 followers by the end of the day and he was addicted within a week. So I promise you, you'll enjoy it. It's not a chore. Now, remember the hashtag is LandCareConf14. I'd now like to introduce the man who's not on Twitter or Facebook. Do you exist? <laughs> <laughs> Only in the social media world. Ian Thompson from the Department of Agriculture. Ian is First Assistant Secretary of the Sustainability and Biosecurity Policy Division in the department. This role means Ian is responsible for fisheries and sustainable agricultural policies and programs, onshore weed, pest and disease management, biosecurity emergency management, agricultural and veterinary chemicals, water, community, and indigenous engagement, and of course, land care. How big is your business card? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Ian. Thank you. Before I start, I'd like to express my respect for and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this event takes place and their elders past and present. Today I'm going to talk to you about whole of government approaches to natural resource management, but as we're celebrating the special and significant anniversary of 25 years of land care, I also want to talk about the successes of land care over the past 25 years and where it might head over the next 25. It's always worth reflecting on where we've come from, the history of land care. I believe land care has come a long way and achieved a lot. Starting here in Victoria in 1986, it brought together farmers and others in the community who wanted to do something about improving the land degradation that was visibly affecting their farms and regions. Then, as you know, in 1989, saw the Australian Government announce the decade of land care, emphasising landscape-wide but local responses to national challenges of concern. Within five years, there was an explosion of local land care groups, with as many as 4,000 groups recorded in 1998, representing about 30% of the farming community. Today, there are around 6,000 land care groups across Australia, and there are more than 100,000 land carers participating in activities every year. This community is diverse and broad. It includes all of the friends of groups, coast care, dune care, river care, urban care, river care, bush care, water care, sea care, river care, land care, coast care, it goes on. Lots of names, very broad community. I'm in government, I've been involved in uh, land care since the uh, early 90s um, at the government level, but I have done my share of uh, tree planting as well and uh, working with farmers on the ground. But I'm often asked if I believe land care has made a difference 
I believe it has. And I also think it can continue to make a difference if we're willing and want to help it grow and innovate. When we travel across the landscape, it looks different now to what it did in the 70s and 80s. The hills are wooded, riverbanks are protected and shaded, pastures are permanent and crops are tilled minimally. In a dust storm, the country doesn't blow anymore. But there's always a way to go. It takes a long time for water quality to improve demonstrably, for soil degradation to be permanently rehabilitated, for wetlands to be restored, for birds and other wildlife to come back. But land care is making progress. One of the objectives of the original decade of land care was to increase the understanding of the problems caused by land degradation and to raise awareness of and implement solutions to these problems. Well, I think it's achieved that. You just have to look around this room, you have to look at the Australian landscape. Awareness and understanding has changed. But it's also worth thinking about some of the concrete things where land care has contributed and made a difference. More resilient farming systems, increased biodiversity, reduced land degradation, improving the condition of soil, ultimately improving farm productivity. In numbers, 70% of cropping land is now minimally cultivated. 65% of agricultural businesses that report native vegetation on their holdings, of these, 55% protect an estimated 30 million hectares for conservation purposes. That's a big effort. The eminent uh, ecologist David Lindenmeyer has shown that vegetation registration, uh, vegetation restoration in the temperate woodlands of South East Australia has improved biodiversity over the last 10 years. Lizards and birds are coming back. It's not just trees. Guidance is available for any farmer now on vegetation management on the farms that work for the plants and animals on the farm, but also work for productivity. And land care has contributed to this. It's worked from the ground up. It achieves that common goal for the community and freedom for all and flexibility to address the big issues but also accommodate local circumstances. In the early days we talked about bottom up, we talked about ownership of the problem and the solution. I think that still holds today. Ownership of the problem and its solution means that achieving results can give communities a greater sense of purpose and achievement and deliver enduring change. The highly infectious nature of land care has been a key to its success. It builds on collective enthusiasm and passion of individuals, and we see that in the examples that are talked about at this conference. I should run through, since we're talking about whole of government approaches to natural resource management, the Australian government uh, programs uh, related to this, uh, natural resource management and land care. The Australian government is committed to ensuring land care continues to grow and has invested over $2 billion in a package of natural resource management programs over the next four years. This is a complementary package that includes the Green Army, uh, Reef 2050, Working on Country, a land sector package related to climate change and the National Land Care Program. The Green Army, as many of you know, is a hands-on practical grassroots environmental action program. It supports the local environment and heritage conservation projects across Australia. It's complementary to the National Land Care Program as the outcomes are both aligned. We've been actively encouraging NRM organisations to help build the links to groups that have projects that Green Army and service providers can work with. It's not going to work everywhere or for everyone, but in those places that it can work, it can be a complementary addition to the land care effort. Land care groups and networks can also engage directly with Green Army project, uh, program as project sponsors. But most of us here are probably more interested in the National Land Care Program itself. Uh, as I said, I've been involved in land care uh, since its beginning, and we've also always seemed to have a program called the National Land Care Program of some sort. And it's always been about the support the government provides to natural resource management and community action on the ground. It's not trying to take over land care, it's the government's support for land care. Through the National Land Care Program, the government is seeking to protect and improve our local, national and internationally important natural assets and values and support sustainable production at local and regional scales. The program has put land care back at the centre of land management, involving community and land care groups in prioritising and delivering regional outcomes. The program has a regional stream and a national stream, and most recently the government has announced its intention to run a small grants round aimed at land care and community groups. 
programs have to achieve things and deliver things. The National Land Care Program, this National Land Care Program, also has its objectives and they run right through the program. We want to see communities are managing land, the landscapes to sustain long-term economic and social benefits from their environment. The farmers and fishers are increasing their long-term returns through better management of the resource base. That communities are protecting species and natural assets and that communities are involved in caring for their environment. To achieve these goals, we want to increase engagement and participation of the community, all parts of the community. We want to maintain and improve ecosystem services that the landscape provides at the local and regional level. We want to restore and rehabilitate the natural environment, protecting internationally significant species, but also communities, places and values that the community and, va and, uh, and regions and the nation values. We want to increase the number of farmers and fishers adopting the practices that improve the quality of the resource base and the services that that land provides. Ultimately, the Commonwealth Government is accountable for pursuing matters of national interest and significance, particularly for meeting our international obligations and fulfilling legislative responsibilities. All governments have responsibilities, but the government has chosen to do this through local action, through land care, and it's chosen to do this because land care has shown it can work, local action delivering on national outcomes. I'll run through a, a little more detail on each of the major elements of the program and then turn to some examples of a few projects which I think illustrate how the program can operate at the local, the regional level and still deliver national outcomes. It can be done. It can show how well-informed, well-planned and well-executed local action can address on those outcomes for a better environment and a better natural resource base. I said before the government is committed to the program with over $2 billion with this suite of programs. It's a substantial commitment to natural resource management. It has a couple of streams. A national stream, which is those elements that the Commonwealth just has to de deliver and it's required to do it itself. In this component are things like 20 million trees program to re-establish green corridors and urban forests. The small grants round, which I mentioned earlier, and $47 million, which um, I have the responsibility for, for managing uh, incursion managements, uh, diseases, pests that cross our border and threaten agriculture and the environment. And we want to work with state and territory governments, industry and the community to prevent new pests and diseases from arriving or spreading. There are also some other investments which are already committed. These include things like Coastal River Recovery, Cumberland Cor Conservation Corridor in Sydney, uh, whale and dolphin protection plans, major contribution of over uh, to the uh, World Heritage Programs, environmental stewardship, Indigenous protected areas and the reef. And I'll come back to the reef because it provides a particularly good example of action at all levels. And in addition, the government is supporting uh, state and territory national land care networks uh, this financial year. Effective relationships between the land care networks, industry and NRM organisations will help the strategic management of resource management, will help build the partnerships that make land care and better natural resource management work. The biggest chunk of the program is the regional stream. It's the stream working with the 56 regional bodies that were put in place um, now almost uh, 14 years ago. $450 million into those NRM organisations, including giving Ocean Watch um, some responsibility in the marine environment for improving practices in recreational and commercial fishing. The regional stream focuses on locally driven natural resource management activities, promoting community engagement and participation and supporting public good outcomes in environmental uh, management and sustainable production. To help ensure land care is at the centre, regional organisations are required to invest a minimum of 20% of their funding in local projects and activities, and this includes land care. These activities are based on regional and local priorities, but they can also contribute to national objectives. That adds up to more than $90 million. That's a fair contribution that the community effectively has for achieving its objectives. Many regions already uh, achieve this target and some exceed it. Under the program, we would like to see land care groups, industry and local governments working together to achieve uh, the best outcomes. I'd like now to just run through a few projects which I think can illustrate how communities 
industries, regions and governments can work together to deliver outcomes that are of genuine national significance. Some demonstrate good research and planning, others demonstrate the importance of relationships, others demonstrate how we can integrate resource management with biodiversity management and with farm profitability. There are examples. It's not a, a list of pet projects or favourite projects. There are lists that provide good examples. So no one should feel embarrassed if their projects aren't there. There's hundreds of good projects, if not thousands, across Australia. But these are ones that have come across my desk which have stood out as things that have made a difference. The first one, Glenelg Hopkins here in the Western District of Victoria, well-established CMA, operating over many years. Like many long-established, well-settled regions, resource degradation caused by pest plant and animals, habitat loss, dry land salinity, declining water quality and soil erosion was prevalent. The CMA put in place a range of programs to help support the community to address the issues. It started with a really solid plan, the Glenelg River Restoration Project in the early 2000s. Now it in, then involved partnerships with nearly, nearly 700 individual landholders, community groups, government agencies to improve the health of the river. The river provided an iconic place that everyone could look and say, our project works if the river gets better. 2004, the Glenelg Friends of the Glenelg Group were formed. Those people wanted to passionately protect their river. Bottom up, grassroots support. Over the life of the project, nearly 800 kilometres of waterway frontage, direct seeded and 50,000 planted trees. It's an example of farmers, farmer groups, communities, CMAs working together. It also operated the whole of catchment, whole of landscape level. The Glenelg Hopkins, many farmers in the regions, put together a soil health strategy and that is aiming to build awareness in the community and in the farming sector of the benefits of healthy soil towards healthy production and a healthy landscape. They built partnerships with the community. They promoted the value of soil health in landscape resilience and they were addressing those problems of salinity and erosion. Land care groups had a really important role. They helped increase participation by grassroots people. They were key to exchanging knowledge and information and they were the people doing the on-ground work. My next example is about Greening Australia on a whole of landscape conservation uh, example. It's an environmental NGO, um, but it was coordinating work across the whole landscape. 1994, a farmer decided to take direct uh, conservation action on his property near Bynalong on the southwest slopes of New South Wales and uh, commenced what we now call Whole Paddock Rehabilitation Program, WAPA. His land had been heavily cleared, erosion, bushfires, loss of tree cover, dryland salinity, salt scores, no doubt rabbits, the usual story that you'd see in a closely settled area. Using direct seeding, put in 40 kilometres of native trees and shrubs, alleys across the landscape and it was seen to work. Community and scientific monitoring found in, by 1996 that the project was meeting its objectives. The salt levels had started to decline and by 2001 the problem had largely disappeared. Greening took this project and said this looks pretty good um, and then said but it could also contribute to connectivity and biodiversity management in the landscape. They joined it together and invented the, the broader WAPA program which can help provide trees and a managed landscape to help with climate variations, pest and disease management, shelter for livestock and maintain uh, reduced salinity and improve soil condition. A lot of people saw this as success. 2010-11, this same concept has now been extended across other regions in southern and central New South Wales and into Western Australia. That sort of approach shows that something that was the idea of the community, one individual builds into a community activity, gets seen by others, copied by others, and can spread nationally and deliver good outcomes right across the nation. I think I've got behind on the slides. Um, the next one I want to turn to is uh, the Barrier Reef. I'll move through this quickly. The Barrier Reef uh, has a fair bit anyway. We all know the Barrier Reef is a, a major icon, huge tourism value and supports a really valuable marine ecosystem. Um, but it also receives water from a large area of Queensland, lots of agriculture, lots of agricultural development, and sediments, nutrients and pesticides leaving that land does have an impact on the reef. 
landholders, agricultural industries across the Great Barrier Reef catchment in Queensland are making progress towards halting and reversing the decline in water quality. A coordinated plan of action was put together by regions and industry and environmental NGOs to come to government and say we need coordinated action to improve land management practice to improve the quality of water in the reef. Governments got on board with this and put in significant money, $200 million over the first five years and over $200 million again in the next five years, a lot of it going to work with farmers to improve land management practice and make measurable change in practices which will lead to measurable changes in nutrient loads in the reef. The report cards have shown that we are starting to halt and reverse the decline of 59% of horticultural producers of uh, change practices, 49% of sugarcane producers and 30% of graziers have adopted improved land management practices. And as a result, estimated average annual pollution loads entering the reef have significantly reduced. We're talking about an area of Queensland. It's about a third of Queensland. It's a lot of area. So a, a lot of people making a small change can make a very big difference. Work needs to continue, though. There is a new Reef uh, 2050 plan where government, regions and industry are continuing to work to improve the water quality on the reef. And the National Land Care Program will continue to contribute to that with over $200 million put into that. And in addition, a reef trust has been established, which also aims to improve uh, practices and support, uh, improve water quality. And it is trying to do this by not just drawing on government money, but by leverage uh, funding from private sector, philanthropy and others. It could be an exciting time over the next 25 years for the Barrier Reef. The Barrier Reef, though, wasn't just built on action on the ground. It's also built with a lot of planning behind it, some really good science to target investments and careful monitoring of what practice change is taking place, whether this is having an effect on the, uh, the water quality, what's happening on the water quality itself, and then again, continuing research on what practices are working, what ones aren't working, series of committees between government and community um, to, uh, to keep inventing and keep trialling and keep refining practices that work. They all seem to be biggish projects, but Landcare also works at a very local level, and very local level projects can also make a contribution at the national level. This is a smaller example on the south coast of New South Wales, where a range of partners are working on the Gulagad Biomanga Koala Potteroo and Cultural Connections Project. It's just looking after a small area of land to look after some threatened species. It's supported by the local CMA, but it also involves farmers, community groups, local councils and indigenous communities. The Australian government supports it because it's looking after nationally listed species and iconic species like the koala. It's engaging landholders in rebuilding a resilient landscape with strong biodiversity and indigenous cultural outcomes. The local indigenous people are seeing this as an opportunity to engage with landholders to explain to them the importance of certain species and that country to their culture. That's improving community cultural relationships. It's very part of that social and cultural value of a land care project. One could say it's putting heart back into the land. But as well as being a social project, it's also doing it in a sensible way and producing data. It's measuring that it's protected over 2,000 hectares of land. They are controlling foxes, which keeps farmers and the environment happy. That's halfway point. It's ahead of its target. A really typical project of, of local scale action is groups of people coming together to address nationally listed weed species. Northern Territory, Indigenous uh, people, pastoral people, government working together across an area nearly the size of Tasmania to address Mimosa pigra. Culturally and environmentally significant sites are being protected, native species are being protected and pastoral productivity improved. Groups of people working together on a national strategy. Well they're just examples but there are some lessons I think that come out of them and we can say well why do these projects work locally and why do they work locally? And nationally. Well, I think critical to the success of the projects were that they were carefully designed well in advance of any project calls. They didn't wait for somebody to say, we've got some money. They said, we've got a problem. Let's start thinking about some solutions. So the time was put into developing cost-effective actions and partnerships that were most likely to lead to the projected outcomes. They took into account whatever national plans and strategies were around. 
So they fitted in with the planning that was done more broadly. They all built on good science and good data. They were planned with realistic targets and timetables and costings. And in seeking funding, not only did they meet local needs, they could show they clearly contributed to those broader objectives that were in those national strategies. They involved lots of stakeholder engagement at a range of levels, local, regional, national, state. And they leveraged funding in most cases from national and state sources as well as local contributions. We also know they're working because they've well designed and documented monitoring and reporting processes. The last point is important because monitoring can help us show whether we're on track, motivate people to continue action and help funders understand that they're getting value for money. I'll just mention a couple of things. We think monitoring is really important and um, there's, a, there's a few things that have been released in the last couple of uh, years which I think are really important for helping community groups and governments together report on what we're doing. We can always report and monitor better. We can share information between each other. But the things I'd like to mention are the Atlas of Living Australia, which is uh, a significant invest investment by CSIRO in a website for sharing biodiversity information. We're using it as part of our merit reporting on the program, but anybody, community groups, NGOs, regional bodies, can also add information in it. But it already contains a lot of information from museums, herbaria, community groups and government. Information can be accessed from this, information can be shared on it, and it becomes a public reporting tool for sharing information. It's a really exciting resource. For those who are of a more librarian bent and are worried about the loss of knowledge as libraries disappear, we've also put in place NRN Knowledge Online, which is an open access digital archive for publicly funded information from Australian government investments in natural resource management. We have put all our government funded reports in it. You can add yours to it. It will soon be available and open for people to put their material in. It's fully searchable, um, including by Google, and it's fully compliant with the same library software that the National Library uses. So it's, it's trying to establish an archive of reports, of information that won't be lost in government filing cabinets or community body dusty cupboards or public servants' garages. It's already got over 4,500 reports in it and it's growing. Dustwatch is something that people who are concerned about trying to monitor, ground cover might, uh, might be concerned about. Community group, monitoring, ground cover and the sources of dust across the country. Within our own department, we've established the monitor, which makes available to the public information at a regional, state or national scale on agriculture, land use, ground cover and similar sorts of information. Today, we've also added data on nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium fertiliser use and information about biodiversity protection on farm, which has come from ADS surveys in 2012-13. It can be a useful resource for helping you plan activities, and it's not that hard to drive. As I wrap up, I wanted to talk also about the future of land care. What happens in the next 25 years? If we want to have a successful and vibrant land care community, I believe it needs to continue to grow and it needs to innovate and meet the challenges of the future. A um, number of people here I've been speaking to, I've known for 10 or 15 years and they've been involved in land care since the mid 80s. Um, they've seen it grow, they've seen groups come, groups go. We're also talking about what happens to the younger generation. They behave differently, they also use different tools. We need to be able to take into account how they operate, how they want to operate and the challenges of the future. There are challenges that are around now, just as it was, I think, dust and salinity and erosion that worried people in the 1980s. We're now worried about increasing climate change and variability, changing markets for agricultural products, changing how people will farm, changing community expectations for those products, threats to biodiversity from inc increasing population, pressure from weeds and pests. Land care is based in the community and the community's time and capacity to engage is becoming more difficult to get at. People are busy. Fifteen years ago, there was another National Decade of Landcare conference here in Melbourne. It was the conclusion of the decade. It wasn't 25 years, it was 10 years. And like this conference, it was looking to the future. One paper, which anyone who was there will remember, and there, I know there were some people who were there, was by Jules Pretty, who's a rural, rural sociologist, and it created a lot of discussion. It 
canvassed the concept of community movements shifting from dependence in their early days, they're dependent on somebody giving them money or some particular individual keeping them going, moving through independence when they get on their own two feet, through to interdependence when they depend on each other. They don't need external support, they get their, their resources, they get their energy, they get their knowledge from each other. 25 years on, has the world changed a lot? Well, 25 years on, there are a lot more people in the movement than there were then. We heard this morning that they were surprised when they achieved their target of 300 groups in uh, the first uh, 12 months. Well, even allowing for groups coming and going, there are still around 6,000 now. So there are a lot of people in that broad movement. We've also got regional NRM bodies planning with resources to do um, uh, mapping with resources for data sets and the like. We've also got a lot more environmental NGOs operating on the ground. We have formalised land care networks. There are multiple funding sources from a range of government agencies, but also from the private sector. In terms of communication, there's been a huge shift. In the 1980s, everyone had to go to a meeting once a month and things were exchanged by the post. The World Wide Web didn't exist in 1999, nor did universal email, ubiquitous smartphones, Twitter, Facebook, or anything of that ilk. People can communicate way more quickly now than they could then. There was also not 25 years worth of experience in the community about how to deliver community-based NRM programs. My view is there's an opportunity for land care to become interdependent, to truly be able to build and grow from within itself and then go to outside sources to say, we've got something we can do and what's more, it's something you want done, therefore help us with it. They can share knowledge and experience and resources. They can build new opportunities between all those players and continue to learn from each other. I've outlined some ways and some examples in this talk about how partnerships can work and build, and I think you can probably see from the examples I've used how government looks at those programs. Um, you might look at some of them differently and have a different story to tell about the case study, but the lessons we draw from it were the ones I outlined. So you can see that there are opportunities for those sorts of partnerships. I think it's also clear that things that the community want to do and can do can also lead and deliver on things that a state wants, a nation wants, or we need internationally. Local and national can join up. But there is the issue of community capacity itself. And at the end of the day, that's all in Landcare's hands. My view would be that the Landcare movement is essentially in Landcare's hands. It's not in anybody else's. With so many people here today and over the next uh, tonight and tomorrow, there must be an opportunity for people to have those informal discussions between each other about the future, about their strengths, about where they want to go, who they can work with, to move forwards as a group. Do some changes need to be made in the land care movement? That's a question for land care. What might the change be? That's a question for land care. What might be the best way to get a common view on the way forward? That's something you need to discuss yourselves. One thing that came out in this morning's discussion, I think, uh, I'm not sure who said it, but was unlikely alliances gain support. NFF and ACF in one room together, the government said, we have to back this, these people should be at war. People like to support groups who appear to have a common purpose. It means you're backing a winner and it's likely to succeed. I'm confident that an innovative and growing land care com uh, community can continue to play a role in important things at the national level while delivering things locally. I think they can contribute to protecting and enhancing the environment. They can help us build and maintain a more resilient resource base. They can improve long-term productivity of resource-using industries and maintain vibrant rural communities. I believe partnerships with all in the community, government at all levels, industry, both rural and in other sectors, and the research community will be important to achieving this. Well, th thank you, Ian. That was a fascinating speech. And we have some roving mics out there, so if people have questions. And I noticed one comment on Twitter, someone remarking you were a brave man to try and talk about the Green Army in this room. So there you go. Thank you, Ian. I, <laughs> Over thank here. You, Ian. I think I've got this on. I noticed that you put fissures up there um, next to um, the agricultural 
industry as uh, one of the players and I'm glad to see that because one of the things you didn't mention was um, acidification. Acidification of the water which in which the fishes are operating is having a huge effect on the effect of, on the ability of people to um, grow uh, things on land and in particular our oxygen levels. Thanks. That was I think that was a comment. I'd agree. Uh, yeah. um, fishes historically haven't um, been recognised as, as widely as they might. Fishes often have a lot in common with um, land care groups. There's actually a lovely example on the south coast of New South Wales of dairy farmers, oyster farmers, tourists and the recreational fishing sector working together because they've all got this one goal of tidying up the waterway because everyone's a winner. And we've got a question up the back here. Thanks and thanks for a really informative uh, talk. Um, I suppose the thing is, how do, how do we overcome the tensions between a nationally coordinated community-based land caring activities with the current one-stop shop arrangements where issues of national significance are to be handed over to royalty-driven state and territory governments? It's going to be, it's a bit of a paradox in that we're having this uh, nationally coordinated community-based approaches to land management, but systemically, uh, most of the land degradation and, and environmental issues are being handed over to the states, which don't seem to be part of this conversation. Um, maybe that's a, a question that needs to, to continue to be talked about, is how do we work with the Commonwealth and the states? Um, you're talking there about the environmental assessment of new developments, which under the EPBC Act are to be um, go through a one-stop shop with the states. Um, that's about a process for assessing uh, new developments. Um, and the aim there is to improve efficiency of that. At the end of the day, state governments and the Commonwealth governments are all accountable to the same electors and by and large the same pressures. And um, uh, the argument goes that why do we have two assessment processes? Let's do them right once. And the state processes have to match Commonwealth standards. So it's not about lowering standards, it's about tidying up the process. On the other side, though, is what are we doing about improving the problem we've got now? And the Commonwealth and the states do work together um, in these areas. Historically, land care was an initiative that worked very closely with the states. In many of the programs now, they work very closely with the states. The reef programs are done closely with the states. Anything we do about weeds and pests integrates with state work. Um, states have varying degrees and means of supporting their regions and their community land care groups. Um, and uh, from a, an Australian government point of view, we meet with our colleagues regularly and talk about how we can do things jointly. We'd all like to do it better, and I'm sure the people who are involved in environmental regulation would like to have a, a nice, clean process where they can understand who's going to do what bit. But a lot of that's about getting uh, better efficiency because there are a lot of overheads involved in having two levels of government trying to do the same thing. And in, in land care, the states are close to the ground. They do have uh, some extension offices, they have research offices, and they have community workers who can actually help. Local governments can play a role in land care. Perhaps one of the challenges for the future that we do have to, uh, to work through as we go forward is how we can bring uh, local government, state government, Commonwealth government together better as we design and plan um, for action. I'm not saying we've got it right, but the aim is to be able to work with those other tiers of government, just as we say quite blithely to the community, I'll oh, work with your region. There's a challenge for the Commonwealth to work with the state as well, and uh, we've got to keep working at that. We've got a question here, and then we might come down the front with the mic after that one. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for your talk. This is on the Barrier Reef. Um, I'm from uh, Wynyard in Tasmania, uh, Wynyard Landcare. Uh, and I spend a lot of time in Townsville, in Queensland, well, I was up there a few years ago when uh, everyone was talking about all these fertilisers and everything going on the uh, Great Barrier Reef. Now, one of the things that I noticed, the Bowley River, which is a major river uh, in Townsville, full of rubbish. And I'm talking about plastic, bottles, cans, uh, whatever. Every time the ra it, they have their wet season, all of this rubbish ends up on the Barrier Reef. I wrote to the, the then Premier and pointed this out. As a result of that, the um, fine for dumping rubbish was raised from one dollar, uh, from one hundred dollars to a thousand dollars. In Tasmania, it's four thousand dollars for dumping rubbish. 
Um, all of this rubbish is still going onto the barrier reef. Is there anything being done about it? Um, I, I don't think I, I, I know whether what's being done about rubbish onto the, the barrier reef, but what I would say is I mentioned in the talk the Reef 2050 plan and what it tries to determine is the priorities for improving the quality of water and the management of the reef and it sets out responsibilities and targets for the Commonwealth and the state. And that sort of managing rubbish and local government planning and effluent from sewage treatment plants would be the sorts of things that we'd be expecting the states and the local government to be looking after to match our contribution that we're making to science, research, reef trust and uh, helping farmers. It's got to be a partnership. It's pretty difficult for the Commonwealth to be doing anything about um, rubbish disposal in Mackay, but it is something the Mackay City Council can probably do something about, and it is in their interest to do something about it. Sometimes it's just exposing it as an issue and it embarrasses the council and they say, yeah, we'd better do something about that. Our tourism depends on it. We've got a question here. Oh, well, one here. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Ian, for a very profound address. Under, under your title of whole of government, and you're mentioned to changing markets, and we're all aware of the National Food Plan. Is there an opportunity to involve a whole of government, or other government departments to be more blunt, um, in giving stronger support for what I would call the export of all this knowledge that we have now developed, that you referred to, to, for, uh, to our international benefit? In other words, can we sell more of this knowledge? Um, consultants and academics in the room might be able to comment more on the value we can get by actually selling the knowledge itself. Um, I'm not sure that the market's that great for it. It's not like selling um, knowledge about smarter ways of selling coal mines, but I'm sure there's uh, opportunities there. Australian uh, agronomists and the like go and work in dryland countries in China and Mongolia and whatever else, and that keeps them occupied. The big value I would see in sort of selling our knowledge, and it's where we're taking a whole of government approach um, through the current um, work on the Green Paper in Agricultural Productivity and the Northern Development Paper, is Australia isn't in the business of selling low value product into bulk commodity markets from our use of the land. We're into selling high value products into markets that are prepared to pay for them. And a lot of those markets want to know that the production's sustainable, the animal welfare is looked after, the milk's of high quality, and in some of those markets we actually get a premium like milk into China, but in many others we're accessing a higher, a higher value market rather than a lower one. Now it doesn't happen all the time and not everyone gets much of a premium, but some people do. But it means we're selling into a market where we don't have to compete quite as often with um, Kazakhstan and Argentina. And we're able to do that because we've got ways of farming dry land, uh, land well because beef in the barrier reef catchment isn't destroying the Brazilian rainforest as a comparison. That our wine isn't um, creating more salinity in the River Murray. That um, birds aren't being destroyed as we grow wheat crops. Those sorts of things are part and parcel of our, our marketing ethos. They're also part of tourism. So I think it's not so much selling the knowledge itself it's actually selling the products that our knowledge for good, sustainable resource management can make. And I think the big value ones come from inbound tourism and they come from being able to convincingly tell people that the products we're selling are products that are safe and sustainable. Now, I mentioned a couple of examples, like the Chinese love Australian milk and New Zealand milk because they know it's safe to drink for their babies. That middle class in China is about 200 million people and we also know that they'll pay very good money for Australian seafood because they know where it comes from and it comes from a pretty place and they've got a picture of it on the box. There are markets around for that stuff. It's not for everyone, but it is certainly for some. And more broadly, that sort of movement grows a bit, markets in it. So I think we sell our knowledge through the product, not as knowledge itself would be my answer. Thank you. And we have another question down here at the front. Yes, no? uh, Thank you very much for your talk. I found it to uh, be quite enlightening. I was just um, looking at the screen and there was a lovely photo there of the uh, Great Barrier Reef. And I just wondered how the government uh, uh, addresses the question of 
mine development and port development in Queensland and the, uh, the dredging issues <laughs> and how, that, how, the, how do you balance those uh, influences? Um, I mentioned earlier that an awful lot of the, um, the barrier reef catchment is under agriculture which means an awful lot of sediment and nutrient by any definition is going to reach the reef and we've been looking after a program that has improved that. Agriculture is improving and getting its house in order. The um, mining development, the industrial development is worth a lot of money to the Australian economy. It's very important to our standard of living and maintaining our economy and the government does have a very difficult balancing act to do there. The approach that it's taken is to put in place a to work with Queensland on a strategic plan for the reef. It is looking at things like disposal of dredge spoil on land, not in the sea. It is looking at concentrating port development uh, where it can. Um, and I know from my personal experience in working in, in fisheries, new aquaculture developments in the reef catchment face a higher level of regulation than anywhere else in the country. And effectively, effluent from aquaculture developments, which can be quite high, has to end up with an improved water quality in the reef, not a decrease. They've actually got to pay for some towns, sewage treatment to be cleaned up. So it's, yes, there is a lot of uh, industrial uh, development along the, the reef, and it does have a lot of localised uh, impact, and it's very dramatic, and it could have some systemic impact. The government's looking at it very carefully. It has a plan to, to manage it, and it's trying to do that through the, the regulatory and planning arrangements. And the monitoring is there to see what is going on. It's there for, for all to see. But it, it's a difficult balancing act. Um, big area, um, a lot of value. Well, I think we've, uh, yeah, we're sorry, we've run out of time, but uh, thank you for, thank you very much, Ian. If we could all put our hands together for Ian.